Okay, Earth Science students, continuing my series of PowerPoints. I am Brian Miller Hicks. Um, we're going to talk about igneous rocks. Igneous comes from, I believe, a Greek word, ignis, or maybe Latin word, which means fire. And that's well named because rocks of the igneous type are those rocks that form from originally molten rock, originally formed from magma, which cools underneath the Earth's surface, or lava, which cools above the Earth's surface. So let's step back a bit and talk about the three types of rocks in Earth science and geology. Rock groups, if you will. They are igneous, which we'll talk about now, sedimentary, and metamorphic. This graphic is a significant one in geology or science in terms of the concept of cycling rocks, the rock cycle. What this shows is that any type of rock can transform into any other type of rock. In other words, an igneous rock through weathering, breaking up from uh, chemical or physical weathering, can break into fragments which can then be transported by water and redeposited as sediment, which gets buried, cemented, and compacted to turn into sedimentary rock, as you see here. So igneous rock forms from the cooling of magma or lava, becomes igneous rock, breaks down through weathering, deposited in sediment, gets buried, lithified, compacted, and cemented to become sedimentary rock. Now sedimentary rock can actually be broken back up into sediment, or it can be reheated, melted, and become magma or lava again. Sedimentary rock can also be subjected to stresses of tectonism through deep burial, faulting, uh, subduction, um, collision, and become metamorphic rock. So metamorphic rock is that rock which has been changed by temperature and pressure conditions. Metamorphic rock can be melted back into magma and so can sedimentary rock, as I've said before. So sedimentary rock can become igneous rock. Metamorphic rock can become igneous rock. Igneous rock can become sedimentary rock. Igneous rock can be metamorphosed as well into metamorphic rock. So that's what we mean by the rock cycle. So the interchange of process, time, and temperature and pressure conditions, rock can transform into different forms of rock. So when we talk about igneous rock and the melting of rock, that only occurs at certain temperatures and pressure that commonly occur in the interior of the earth with depth. So we have an upper crust and then we have a lithosphere and we have a mantle and a core. So everything within the mantle itself is molten rock, semi-solid to solid, but molten still because it's under such conditions of such high temperature and pressure that it's actually molten. It's not actually crystallized per se at this depth. It only becomes crystallized when it starts to get cool, cooler under more uh, near surface conditions. So what supplies the heat that heat up uh, the interior of our Earth? Well, there's three main sources. There's the residual or leftover heat from the collision of fragments of rock, planetary fragments during the formation of our planet 4.6 billion years ago. So there's still heat left over from all those collisions. 
Second source of heat is from radioactive decay. The interior of the Earth has radioactive isotopes. When they decay from an unstable to a stable, more stable isotope, they release heat through radioactive decay. The thirdly is that uh, heat source called the geothermal gradient, which simply states that the deeper you go in the Earth, the hotter it's going to get. Denser, hotter conditions, closer and closer you get to the center of the Earth. Maximum temperatures in our Earth, of course, are at the core. Okay, so what are igneous rocks made of? You know that from our, uh, our discussion of minerals, that everything is made of atoms. All elements are made of atoms. And rocks are made of elements which are in crystal form. So we have igneous rocks that have um, general, but uh, igneous rocks are basically compounds formed of different elements. This is something called the, uh, well, it's, there's now an actual name for it. It's a chart actually showing different types of igneous rocks categorized by their texture and their silica composition, basically. So if we start at the left side, left upper side, these are igneous rocks that are felsic or more in the granitic range, granite and rhyolite. Going from left to right, we go from rocks that contain more silica to rocks that contain less silica. Silica, of course, is silicon dioxide, um, the type of material, the type of compound that forms quartz. So as we go from left to right, this says increasing silica from right to left, of course. So felsic rocks can contain as much as 75% silica. Ultramafic rocks can contain as low as 40% silica. In between, we have intermediate and mafic. Okay. Now the types of rocks that are felsic examples would be granite and rhyolite. The granite is that rock that is felsic, that is intrusive, that forms and cools below the surface of the earth. Rhyolite is that type of felsic rock that cools above the surface of the earth as a lava, but with the same composition as granite. So that's why these two are paired up together. Granite is intrusive, cools underground. Rhyolite is extrusive, cools above ground. Same with these pairings. Diorite is the intermediate right rock that is intrusive and the site extrusive. As we go towards the right, less silica. Gabbro is intrusive. The salt is extrusive. And then we have peridotite and comatite which occur essentially in the upper mantle. It's very rare that we find them near the surface. So let's look at the content of this chart in the center. Again, to the left we have high silica, less fluid, low silica, more fluid. What does that mean? Let's talk about that for a bit. If you have more silica in a magma or a lava, you have more silicon tetrahedrons, remember SiO4. So there's more chance of these tetrahedrons kind of locking up and clustering up and chaining up and kind of thickening the mix because there's more uh, silica tetrahedra. Okay, that makes the magma or the lava less fluid. On the low silica end is more fluid because there's less silica so less silica tetrahedra to uh, cause a traffic jam, if you will. Okay. So let's look at some other things um, on this chart. Going from left to right, you have less silica as you go to the right, 
but increasing iron, magnesium, and calcium. So basalt, for example, would have more iron and more magnesium. That's actually reflected in the name mafic. Mafic means Ma for magnesium, and Fic stands for Fe, which is the elemental name or the chemical name for iron. On the left side, more silica, less iron, less magnesium. Felsic means more feldspar and more silica. Feldspar and silica, more silica on the left side. Magnesium and iron, more magnesium and iron, less silica on this right side. One more thing to point out, the felsic igneous rocks form at a lower temperature than the higher temperature mafic rocks. Uh, I apologize once again, I'll have to learn how to move this box around. It doesn't seem to want to cooperate with me and move. Um, I'll have to look that up. So temperature at which melting begins for a felsic rock is only 700 degrees centigrade. Whereas for a mafic rock, because it contains more iron and more magnesium, it melts at a higher melting point. Here's another chart showing rock samples rather than just a graphic. So once again, on the left side, we have felsic or granitic rocks intermediate and mafic. You'll note this word phaneritic means coarse grain. This is actually not spelled right. It should be C-O-A-R-S-E. Okay, why would granitic rock be coarse grain? Remember, it's an intrusive rock, which means it cools under the ground. Because it cools under the ground, it cools a bit more slowly because it cools a bit more slowly, it allows time for those grains to grow, for those crystal grains to grow larger. The intermediate uh, and acidic rock is also fairly coarse grain. Um, the mafic <clears throat> basaltic rock is actually, um, I'm sorry, mafic gabbro rock is also coarse grain. So, all these rock types, granite, diorite, gabbro, they're all intrusive, so they're coarse grain. They cool below the surface of the earth. Athenitic means fine grain. These are the lavas, rhyolite, andesite, basalt. The lavas are rock that make it to the earth's surface, and because they're cooling under atmospheric, cool atmospheric conditions, exposed to the air, they cool a lot quicker. That means crystals don't get a chance to develop because of the more rapid cooling. Porphyritic means two stages of cooling. It means that perhaps the um, rock was uh, underneath the surface of the earth, cooled slowly, made these large crystals that you see here, and then it was erupted toward, towards the surface of the earth and the rest of it cooled quickly. That's what you see is the finer material surrounding the coarser grains. Okay, so this chart has to do with texture and it has to do with grain size and cooling rates and the environment of cooling. Phaneritic coarse grain rocks are intrusive rocks which cool underground. Aphanitic or fine grain rocks cool at the surface of the earth as lavas. Let's go and get into igneous rock textures a little bit more. And I'll show you some cool pictures of typical igneous rocks. This is basalt. It's mafic, remember, it's high in iron and magnesium. It means it's dark colored. It also means it's very hot when it's melted. Because the magnesium and iron in it, that makes the melting temperature much higher 
1200 degrees or more. So this is a basalt lava flow extrusive. Why? Because it's at the surface of the earth. It's extruded. This is in Hawaii. Hopefully some of you have been lucky enough to go to Hawaii. I have been to Hawaii, but not to the big island of Hawaii. The big island of Hawaii is the only island which has active volcanoes. But you don't want to get too close to something like this. Obviously, it's very, very hot. Even if you see a black crust on top of it, I would still be careful because that crust may be just thin crust and you could break through and you don't want to do that. This is intrusive rock, granitic type rock. Another word for intrusive is plutonic. Plutonic meaning deep from the Greek word, I believe. This is Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Now, obviously, these faces are not natural formations. Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln. Um, these didn't form naturally. They were sculpted in the 30s, 1930s, I believe, by a sculptor and his team to make this gigantic monument carved out of intrusive, phaneritic, granitic type rock. Okay. Why, how come we see it if it cooled underground? Well, we see it because everything above it was eroded away. This may have been uplifted somewhat higher than its original elevation below the surface of the earth. And the stuff on top of it, whatever was on top of it, has been stripped away through the years. Remember in all this, whenever I'm talking about any geologic process, anything that we see today, it's taken time to get to be where it's at now. Millions of years, maybe sometimes billions of years, maybe thousands of years, but keep that in mind always. Geology, geologic processes, it all takes time. Another chart showing rock types and the environment of formation. So maybe this will help clear it up a little bit for you to show this picture. Let's look at this affinitic rock. So this is fine grain affinitic. It's probably basalt. This comes from this lava flow, which came out of the volcano, cooled, and because it cooled fairly rapidly, the crystals are very small, so it's fine grain. Here is a phaneritic or coarse grain rock, which formed and cooled underground in what we call a magma chamber, a big blob of molten rock, which took its time underneath the surface of the earth to cool grow large crystals and form this coarse grain rock eventually. Porphyritic rock is that two-stage cooling, sat underground for some time and then got close to, to, to form large crystals and then got closer to the surface and formed finer crystals as you see around here in the black material. Then there's this odd looking rock that we call pumice. Pumice is an igneous rock that's found in a volcanic setting. It's got all these holes in it because it's charged with gas. When a volcano erupts, it doesn't erupt just rock. It erupts a lot of water and it erupts a lot of gas, carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, and other gases. And when you get a bubbling uh, lava near the throat of a volcano, supercharged with rising gas that's been under a lot of pressure and now it's under less pressure. So just like you shake a soda bottle, the carbon dioxide under pressure in that soda bottle, when you shake it up and pop the cork, there's a sudden pressure release and you get a frothing of a mixture of gas and liquid in the soda bottle. In this case, you get a mixture of lots and lots of gas mixing with rock and rock fragments that causes the cooling rock fragments to splinter and break up and be charged with a lot of gas. So what you get is a piece of froth or foam, if you will, 
being erupted from the volcano and cooling into a rock that we call pumice. Pumice is very light in weight because it's full of holes. It can actually float on water and it's glassy texture. There's no or very little mineral or crystallization in it because it cooled so quickly being erupted rapidly from the volcano riding this wave of gases as it's being expelled from the volcano. Um, I'm going to skip this one. We've already gone over that. Another example of a coarse grain granitic rock. This is feldspar, this pinkish brownish stuff. The gray sort of clear grains are quartz and the dark black rock, uh, crystals, minerals, is biotite. Okay, these are all silicate rocks, feldspar, quartz, and biotite are silicates. Here's a porphyritic rock with a two-stage cooling, very large grains, probably of feldspar and quartz, and then a mix of crystals and minerals in the fine grain mass. The salt, fine grained, you can barely see the grains, they're very fine. This kind of orangish to reddish stripe here, this, if you note, there's a fracture or crack in the rock sample. That means water has gotten into this crack and oxidized some of the iron in the basalt in effect has caused the iron in this basalt to rust. That's why you see this rusty red color. Here's a close up of that glassy pumice type rock formed from gaseous frothy rock. Okay, let's take a closer look at volcanic or extrusive rocks. So here is a rock that you may or may not be familiar with. This rock type is called obsidian. Obsidian is a volcanic glass. It's felsic, which means it's high in silica. Even though it's high in silica, it looks darker or, or black because there's little um, metallic impurities. Uh, iron and other metallic ions within it. But if those impurities weren't there, it would be clear, transparent, and very glass-like. It is a volcanic glass because it comes out erupting quickly into the environment, into the air, and cools rapidly into a glass. You can see it's formed into the shape of an arrowhead, and in fact, obsidian has been used for many, many centuries as arrowheads, spear points, knife points, knife blades, cutting tools, scraping tools, etc. Might interest you to know that obsidian is being used even today by surgeons because it has such a fine, thin edge to it that it can be used in surgery for certain uh, certain procedures. I don't know what procedures, I'm not a surgeon, but Stone Age technology, you might say, is being used by modern surgeons. Here's another piece of obsidian or volcanic glass. The kind of orange-brown color you see here is from, again, from, from uh, other minerals being entrained in the volcanic glass itself, giving it its color. This is an obsidian flow. This is at Newberry Craters, Oregon. So this silica rich lava came spilling out of volcanic vent, cooled very quickly into a volcanic glass flow that we call obsidian. Because it's high in silica, being a glass, do you think it flowed rapidly or slowly? It flowed slowly. Remember, high silica, lots of silica tetrahedra binding up with each other, causing traffic jams and making the flow kind of blocky, chunky, and slow flowing. You can see these kind of contour-like shapes in here 
these we call pressure ridges, which form when you have a pasty, slow flowing mass like we see here. The white stuff, for those of you born and raised in San Diego or in the desert, it's called snow. Okay, here's some more types of igneous rock. Pyroclastic rock, what is that? Well, what does pyro mean? Pyro means fire. Clastic means fragment. So pyroclastic means fire fragment. Another general name for this type of rock is called tuff. Pyroclastic rock is that kind of rock that's been shattered, torn apart, ripped up by eruptive energy of a volcano during an eruption. So you get all kinds of fragments from tiny little pieces to boulder sized pieces. It goes up out of the volcano in large clouds of material, falls back down onto the volcano and forms deposits that we call tuff, which include fragments of rock, fragments of glass, very fine grain, glassy texture, um, fragments of whatever came out of the volcano, and then cool and hardened. And some of this tough is literally very tough. When it cools, it, it's very uh, hot. And as it cools, it welds together. It's called a welded tough. And it makes for a very hard rock mass. What else comes out of a volcano? Well, we have bombs. A volcanic bomb is a big chunk of lava that comes spinning and twirling out of a volcano. Maybe it acquires an aerodynamic shape like a football, like you see here. If this is one football, you're not going to want to catch. It's going to be very heavy and very hot. And as it spirals through the air, it gradually cools and lands somewhere away from the volcano. Some of these bombs can be, this one is maybe a foot in length, but bombs can be car size, refrigerator size, even house size. This is what's called a fountain eruption from a volcano in Kilauea. It actually looks like a fountain, fountain of hot rock. All right, I want to introduce a concept that we call Bowen's reaction, Bowen's reaction series. If you look at this chart, let's look at the left side. This is temperature going from 1200 degrees centigrade down to 750 degrees centigrade. So high temperature to low temperature. You look at this side, the rock types, remember, ultramafic, dark rock, low silica, high melting point. Down here we have felsic, light colored rock, lower temperature, higher silica. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, if you look at a magma, what this represents, what this really represents is the crystallization sequence in a magma going from, from the minerals that crystallize first to the minerals that crystallize last. So if you have a pot of magma underneath the surface, a boiling molten pot of magma, which contains all kinds of elements, the first mineral to crystallize out of that melted molten rock is olivine. Olivine is high in magnesium, high in iron, so it needs a high temperature to be liquid. So that means it's going to be the first mineral to crystallize out as the magma starts cooling. Okay, the next mineral to come out is called pyroxene, and then amphibole, and then biotite. So as the magma is cooling, each of these minerals crystallizes out at a different temperature. 
then we get potassium, feldspar, muscovite, mica, and finally, the last mineral to crystallize out of the cooling melt is quartz. So this is the sequence on this side. This also means that if you were to take a igneous rock, for example, that contains quartz, mica, feldspar, and you were to start melting it, the first mineral to melt would be quartz because it came out at the lowest temperature. So if it crystallizes at the lowest temperature, that means it also melts at the lowest temperature. The last mineral that you're going to be able to melt is going to be olivine because it has the highest melting point and the highest crystallization point. This other side is just feldspar. So these, this side of the chart is a discontinuous series of crystallization means as you drop in temperature, different minerals come out. At the same time as you drop in temperature, feldspar starts crystallizing out, but it crystallizes as a calcium rich feldspar and then a sodium rich feldspar. Again, dropping the temperature gives you the sequence of minerals. It, what this is intended to show you is that depending on the temperature at which a magma cools and then erupts, you can get lavas of different compositions. Let's say you have a magma that just starts cooling, so you start to get olivine. If it erupts, it's going to erupt as a mafic uh, basalt type lava because it's rich in the olivine, in the magnesium and iron rich, okay? If you get this stuff coming out and erupting, then what are you left with? If, you're, if you get rid of the iron and magnesium rich minerals, that means the rest of the melting, melted liquid molten rock is going to be enriched in silica. So that's going to be, if that's the last stage of eruption, if the silica rich magma erupts as a silica rich lava, it will erupt as a quartz and mica rich lava or as a rhyolite. I know that's a little complicated, a little bit hard to follow, but just to sum it up, what it means is that lavas um, erupting at different times of the cooling melting scenario will erupt as silica poor magnesium and iron rich or as silica rich lavas, depending on where they are on that scale. Okay, so we've covered extrusive rocks. Let's look at intrusive rocks or plutonic rocks. Plutonic means deep and intrusive rocks are rocks that form at depth. This is El Capitan in Yosemite. Some of you have may, may have been lucky enough to go to Yosemite and seen this huge piece of granite type rock called El Capitan. Maybe some of you have actually are actually climbers and climb this thing. Personally, I wouldn't try it. I don't do very good do very well with heights, so there it is. This is called a monolith. What does monolith mean? Mono means alone or one, lith means rock. So again, just like with Mount Rushmore, this is a piece of rock that was cooled and formed underground, and we only see it because of the uplift of the Sierra mountain range by faulting and the erosion of whatever was laying on top of this rock. Okay, here's a piece of granite. To me, it's like a chocolate chip ice cream rock. That's what it looks like to me. It makes me want to go get some ice cream. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop there. We're going to talk about tectonic settings of igneous rocks and volcanic rocks in the context of volcanism, which I'll cover in a subsequent presentation.